Yes, uh, hello. So, um, yeah, my name is Dominic. I work at the Max Planck Institute of Physics in Munich in the CREST group. And yeah, I'm going to start with a uh, small like, overview of our experiment. Um, this is our uh, collaboration. We're about 50 people from these eight institutions in, in uh, four different countries. And um, so the experiment is uh, a cryogenic direct detection. So HACRES stands for Cryogenic Ray Event Search with Superconducting Thermometers. And our, um, yeah, our main goal is the direct detection of dark matter via the scattering of target nuclei in um, cryogenic detectors that we operate at millikelvin temperatures. Um, the, the location is in the underground laboratory in, in Gran Sasso, so we have a nice uh, shielding from uh, cosmic radiation. Here's a picture from, from outside. And here in this container, we, we have our setup. So we have several uh, additional layers of shielding. There's, um, uh, polyethylene, and then here we have an active muon uh, or active muon vehicle panels, a layer of lead, another layer of copper, and then not shown here inside is another layer of polyethylene. Actually, uh, this is our cryostat that we use for, for cooling down our detectors, and these detectors are held in uh, this thing that we call the, the carousel. The standard design of a Crest 3 module uh, looks like this. So the main part is here is the phonon absorber. So this is our main crystal. It's like two by two by one centimeter. So it's quite small, um, made from scintillate and calcium tungstate. And here, this is our uh, TES. It's a tungsten TES on top of it. With, uh, and the, with these TESs, we, we reach sensitivities to, for nuclear um, recoils for, of less than 100 EV, so in the tens of EV scale. Uh, this disk here is our light detector, so this is a silicon and sapphire wafer, it's very thin, also equipped with a TS, and uh, yeah, this we use for, for particle discrimination, so we have this two channel readout of, of heat and light. Um, the housing is covered with a reflective and scintillating foil, so we maximize the, uh, the measured light, and both of these detectors, so the bulk detector and the wafer, are both held by calcium tungstate sticks that in some cases even are instrumented with the, with the TES uh, themselves. Um, yeah, the, uh, the working principle of these detectors is a cryogenic calorimeter. The, the basic idea is rather simple. So we couple these sensors to a heat bath, or in this case, one should rather say a cold bath. And uh, now if there's a particle interaction in the, in the crystal, um, the sensor heats up, and due to the coupling, it cools back down, and we get a pulse. And so in general, the, the amplitude of these pulses is directly proportional to the energy deposited in the, in the crystal. To be a bit more specific, so uh, these transition edge sensors are operated in a stable operating point exactly in the transition between a normal conducting and a superconducting state. So again, if, if now there's a nuclear recoil and the crystal heats up, and typically in the order of, of microkelvin, um, we can see a change of the resistance in the bias current that is running through this TS uh, in the order of, of milliohm. Um, yeah, this is just read out by some squids uh, and amplified, and then we get uh, one of these nice pulses here that are like millivolt to volt range normally. Uh, we do this for both the phonon and the light channel, and then uh, we collect all these events and we can put them in this uh, so-called light yield plot. The light yield is defined as um, the, the light signal divided by the phonon signal. So for the, for the energy estimation, the x-axis is just, we just use the phonon energy, and then this light yield is calibrated in a way that our dominant backgrounds of, of, nuclear, uh, of uh, electron recoils um, have a light yield of one, and in comparison to that, the nuclear recoils that we're interested in have a uh, quenched light output. So at high energies, we have a really nice um, discrimination power between these uh, types of events. The data analysis is, uh, so, so we have a continuous recording of uh, our data. So for every channel, we have a dead time free uh, stream of data. Um, and then we can process this offline afterwards. And in a first step, what we do is we, we run an optimum filter on the stream to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And then we use this filtered stream to define our trigger threshold by choosing an accepted number of noise triggers that in, in Crest is typically like one noise trigger per kilogram day. And we, we end up in the order of a few kilogram days of exposure for a full run, so this is really not a lot of, of noise triggers. Well, and then, yeah, we select all the events above threshold and process them further. Um, as a first step, we, we have to clean the data, so there's a series of, of selection criteria and cuts that we define to remove all kinds of electronic artifacts, pileups, and these kind of things. 
And then, yes, we end up with the clean spectrum that we calibrate, typically with either cobalt source or, uh, like we did in the last two runs, we used an iron 55 source with peaks around 6 kV. And the last thing we need to do now for, uh, to calculate a dark matter limit or to compare spectra of, of different detectors with each other is to, to run a simulation on the, on the stream of data. So uh, we're doing this by superimposing uh, fake signals onto the whole stream of data. We scale them to different amplitudes, and then we put them through the same analysis pipeline that, as we do for, for normal particle events. And then we can just yeah, check uh, the surviving fraction of events. So here in light gray, you see the surviving fraction after the triggering, and then in, in dark gray, the surviving events after the, um, after the cuts. And uh, so now we have a uh, energy-dependent uh, surviving fraction, and this we just use as an estimate for a survival probability of real particle events and can correct our spectrum for that. Um, the first results of, of CREST-3 were published in 2019, and um, we got some really nice limits from a uh, about 24 gram calcium tungsten detector, exposure of about 5.7 years, at uh, kilogram days. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we, we reached a very low nuclear threshold with this detector of just uh, 30 eV, which allowed us to go down to um, dark matter masses of just 160 MeV, which is, of course, compared to all the axion talks, pretty heavy. But uh, comparing with the other WIMP experiments, this is uh, very much on the low mass range. So CREST is, uh, so Crest is one of the leading experiments in this sub-GV um, mass range. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, in, this, in this run where we got this nice limit, we also encountered for the first time what we call the low energy excess. So you see here a steep rise in the event rate below 200 EV. And this became pretty much the main challenge right now for many um, low threshold direct detection experiments. Especially so, because of course we want to push further down into this unexplored uh, region in the parameter space, but our sensitivity is pretty limited by this excess. Um, and this is not the only detector where we've seen this. In fact, uh, in the same run, uh, we call run 34, which is from 2016 to 18, we saw this in several, or pretty much in all calcium tungstate crystals with different thresholds, and they all show the steep uh, rise of event rate um, in this low, ma uh, low energy range. Um, and then also in the, in the following measurement phase from 2018 to 2019, we could also observe this uh, in, in sapphire crystals, so also in a different material. And one uh, interesting property was that in both of these cases, we could observe that this uh, excess was decreasing over time, uh, over the course of the run. Um, okay, so since this is limiting our sensitivity, the main goal of the current run that was started in November last year and is, is now still ongoing uh, was really not to get new limits, but rather really investigate the origin of this excess. And in order to do that, we applied uh, um, a series of, of modifications to our modules to check different hypotheses or different ideas where this excess could be coming from. So to check any material dependence, we, we added also some more materials. So we have calcium tungsten and sapphire, but also lithium aluminate and silicon crystals. Then to check any effects coming maybe from the holding. So we, we replaced uh, most of the calcium tungsten sticks with copper sticks. And in some cases, we also use bronze clamps so to have a different contact area with the crystal. Um, in many uh, modules, we also removed the scintillating foil. And then to check if scintillation light that is not detected by the light detector could be uh, an origin. We also created one fully non-scintillating module uh, where we just used uh, silicon for both the bulk detector but also this uh, wafer detector. So in this case, this was not a light detector because silicon is non-scintillating, but we could check any um, mass dependence. Okay, but what I can tell you is that independent of all these modifications that we have done to our detectors, uh, we do see an excess in all of them again. So it's still there. As I said, we, we see the excess again in all detectors. Um, and so, so on, the, on, the, on the left here is uh, just a pure count rate per day. And then what we also did is we scaled it with the mass of the detectors to look at the count rate per kilogram day. And uh, interestingly, this rate does not scale with the mass. So for example, the lightest detector was one of these wafer detectors with just uh, yeah, 0 0.3 grams and in comparison to the normal 20, 24 gram detectors had the highest rate. And uh, yeah, so this makes us exclude pretty much a uh, common single particle origin, as a, at least as a major contribution. So external radiation and dark matter is, is not really compatible with this picture. 
Uh, then, of course, we checked also the time dependence since we, we have seen this before. And now let's first look at the, only this left part, which is the dark matter data set. And um, here we, we again could observe that in all of these detectors, the success rate was decaying over time. Um, and if we look at this in, a, in, a, in the same energy range, it's even a comparable um, decay time of about 150 days on average. Uh, then we also checked if, if the neutron calibration maybe has any uh, influence on the rate, which it did not, at least not visibly. Uh, and then, so what we, what we started doing here is uh, based on oops, what our colleagues from the Edelweiss collaboration observed, because they had, uh, after an accidental warm-up of their cryostat, they could see a rise of the event rate, which afterwards decayed much faster. Um, we also wanted to test this, so we did a controlled warm-up of our cryostat to 60K, and indeed, we could see after cooling down, so this is important here to say, this is not still warm. We cooled everything back down to, to uh, the operating conditions and then started measuring again. And in all of these detectors, we had a much higher rate afterwards. And also a much faster decay, which is exactly what the Edelweiss collaboration also observed in their excess. So afterwards, we have on average a decay time of, of just 18 days. And uh, yeah, what we, what we started now is to systematically ramp up these warm-ups. So we did a few to a few hundred millikelvin where we did not see any influence. But now we're checking at which temperature this, this effect uh, starts to set in or if, if we can even reproduce these, uh, uh, this rise of the event rate. But yeah, again, this is another argument against dark matter and against any kind of, of radioactivity. So also like some intrinsic impurities in the crystals we can exclude since, I mean, no, no radiac no, nothing radioactive would, would behave like this. So as a little like in between conclusions for this excess is yeah we, we uh, with the current measurements we could exclude some hypotheses on major uh, contributions which is dark matter interactions external and intrinsic radioactivity uh, then also we check the pulse shapes of these events and we can exclude that these are noise triggers or electronic artifacts and also in the case of the of the silicon module that is completely non scintillating it still has an excess so we can also exclude scintillation light. So there are still some options that we are now further investigating, um, which are in intrinsic, uh, intrinsic crystal effects. So we want to see if, if, we, can ha if we have different um, amounts of rates in the different materials. And then we check sensor-related effects, for example, from the TS film deposition. And uh, of course, uh, also holding induced stress is a very promising uh, um, idea, I would say. And uh, we have a lot of R&D ongoing to, to check these ideas and also keep doing analysis of the, of the current data for this. Okay, nevertheless, the idea was to check, so the main goal was to check this excess. We still managed to get some nice new dark matter results, and one of them comes from a silicon wafer detector. So this is from this thin wafer here with a very low mass, so we just have a very low exposure of just 55 gram days. But this detector reached, um, so far, I think the lowest threshold we have ever managed of just 10 EV for nuclear recalls. And with this, we could, we could go down to masses of... Um, 115 MeV in uh, yeah, dark matter mass. The other result comes from our lithium aluminate detectors. So lithium aluminate is a nice material because this allows us to be um, sensitive to spin-dependent dark matter interactions. So we can check uh, respectively for, for protons and neutrons these spin-dependent in interactions. And there we got the best limits between 250 and 2.5 GeV for, for proton interactions and 160 MeV and 1.5 GeV for neutron interactions. And uh, yeah, two weeks ago when we showed this at the IDM, these were the, the leading limits, but also at the, in the same conference, the new G collaboration showed new results. I think their paper is not out yet, but they actually got a bit better than us here. Um, okay, uh, just to, to wrap it up, what's, what's the future plan for, for Crest? So we're planning to upgrade the whole setup to 288 readout channels. So this will be a bit more than, I think, 100 modules. And uh, within two years of measuring, we should reach ton day exposures here. And yeah, yeah last year, we finalized uh, the, the prototyping and the testing of the wiring and the squid electronics. And yeah, the plan is to install these in our Crest facility um, by next year. On the detector side, in the last two years, we did a lot of R&D to keep lowering the threshold, um, but also to make sure that we, we can keep a high production rate of these detectors. And I mean, we're planning to do a lot. <laughs> um, and yeah, also here the idea is so next, this year and next year we, uh, we're starting to produce them and test them and then upgrade the setup at LNGS so that, uh, yeah, at some point next year we can restart data taking with this upgraded setup. And I don't know how much time I have. Um, would maybe just leave you with this 
summary slide. So we got some nice new dark matter results. Silicon detector allowed us to go to lower masses. The lithium aluminate detectors gave us nice spin dependent limits. And uh, yeah, we're getting closer to figuring out what this low energy excess is. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. And um, there's ongoing efforts to improve our detectors, keep lowering the thresholds. And yeah, we are in process of preparing this major upgrade of the setup at LNGS. Thank you. Thanks for being time. So we already have a question in first line. <clears throat> Uh, probably a stupid question, but uh, how is your event energy related to the dark matter exclusion? I mean, like the kilo electron volt sensitivity and then the mega electron volt dark matter particle. In our, um, the expected recoil rate spectrum is dependent on the dark matter mass and the cross section. And uh, what we do is we, we compare this to our, the measured spectrum. And um, in the end, I mean, the, 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 ma the lower the mass, the lower will be the, the nuclear. Uh, recall energy and I mean the, the relation is just in principle uh, with a 30 EV threshold we were st we, st we just have the end point of the spectrum basically at threshold for a 160 MeV particle in calcium tank state or in, in case of the of the silicon module then of course it, it's a bit material dependent we have this uh, it looks a bit different the spectrum and there for a 10 EV threshold we're just sensitive to the end point to the tail of the recall spectrum of a 115 MeV particle. Yeah. Do you also have sensitivity ah. to um, electronic events, so electronic recoil events, and how, yes. how good it is? is yeah. it? Yes, I mean, if you look at uh, this light yield plot, I mean, we, we are very populated in this, in this electron gamma band, so we could calculate the limit on this. The, the thing is that all, all of our backgrounds, or most of our backgrounds, are in this band, so it's very polluted, and which is not competitive with other experiments that really focus on these electron recoils, so we don't. <laughs> is it possible that this, these decay times are due to strain effects? Because we, we use crystals for low noise oscillators and, or even in optics when you use a resonator, it takes a while for the processes to relax. And if you're over constrained, it could take forever. Uh, sorry, the, the what strain, was Strain, strain. Strains. Strain. So when you strain the crystal, mm -hmm. you get a, you, everything relaxes and there's long de decay times. Yes, I mean, these are some of the ideas that we're checking, right? Uh, so we make sure, so we have also commercially bought crystals, but we also grow them ourselves, for example, and there we try to make sure to, uh, to grow them in a way that there's uh, as less, uh, like, as few internal stress as possible. And then also the way they are held uh, in, the, in the module, um, we try to not create any, any stress yeah, on Yeah, because we found that if, if we held our crystals in certain ways, you would never, it would never decay and it would just linear drift. So that means it was a huge decay time. So you really have to take care of that. Yes. I mean, uh, I think what is very interesting is the fact that after this warm-up, um, the event rate was rising a lot, but then decaying much faster. So... To me, that's all evidence of strain, but I don't know. I mean, if we can figure out what this is, maybe we can make use of this and like, do, for example, a warm-up at the beginning of the run. Again, like warming up a bit, like cooling down, warming up a bit, cooling down again to make this decay faster. But I mean, this all depends on what this really is and where it's uh, coming from. Uh, 